Hi, and welcome back to VCTV. I'm Terence from La Token, and you are now watching us from a few places. You can watch us from our main page itself. So that's Latoken slash VCTV. You can also get us on YouTube. So remember, if you're watching us from anywhere and anywhere, please just click like, sus subscribe, and look into our schedules for the week and the month as well. Because there could be some topics that you might like and you might take interest in. Today on our panel, we have the three gentlemen that you see here, and I'm going to quickly let them introduce themselves. Uh, Lawrence, let's start with you. Tell us a bit about yourself, and let's see. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Terence. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Lawrence. I'm uh, one of the founding partners of Blockwall, uh, a Germany-based venture capital investor that is exclusively dedicated to blockchain investments. And as such, we have established a regulated fund structure a couple of years back, it launched a first closed fund that exclusively invested in token protocols. And we're about to launch a second fund uh, with a first closing that exclusive, exclusively invests in uh, startups, so equity investments that have a strong blockchain component with their business model attached to it. Uh, on top of that, we've launched a couple of months back uh, the Blockchain Research Institute Europe, an independent uh, think tank that uh, connects corporates to the matter in order to help them evaluate, get access and further bring this technology forward. Um, as such, we're, we're a team of eight and um, we're having a lot of fun doing what we do. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Thank you, Lawrence, and welcome back on VCTV. Jose, off to you next. Uh, tell us a bit of yourself. So my name is Jose Grasa. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur, uh, business angel, mentor, VC. Uh, I've been uh, doing these roles now for quite a long time. And uh, today uh, I'm essentially focused on uh, business inclusion. So I mean, any type of technology that can promote uh, business inclusion to every individual on the globe. Obviously uh, that includes uh, blockchain as well, uh, parts of it. And then uh, obviously digital currency is also part of the game, artificial intelligence, machine learning and neural networks. So it's, it's quite broad in that essence, but it's also not very easy to generate a virtual uh, social market economy by itself. So obviously you need a lot of uh, building blocks uh, to make that happen. Um, so that's what I do. And uh, I'm really excited about this uh, topic today. It's uh, really, it's, uh, you know, the, the area that I love. Thank you. Nice. Yes, uh, Gary, over to you. Tell us a bit yeah. about yourself. Yeah, yeah. sure, Terrence. My name is Gary Fowler, and I'm a Silicon Valley-based venture capitalist, uh, entrepreneur. I've done 16 companies, had two unicorns. I was on the original management team at Click Software, which is sold for $1.35 billion, and also Eva.ai, one of the top AI HR tech companies that I started uh, a little over four years ago. So just love artificial intelligence and blockchain. And uh, so we're looking for interesting uh, entrepreneurs that want to go global. Obviously, AI and blockchain are interesting for us. Quantum computing, uh, our specific focus is artificial intelligence. So it's great to be here. It's great to see uh, old friends and new friends. So Lawrence, it's great. So anyhow. We're excited today. I'm actually down in Palm Beach in Florida. During the pandemic, I've been riding out at my house near the beach here. That's always a beautiful thing. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Yeah, sure. so welcome everyone to the panel today. And as you know, we are talking about, I, I think it's quite a heavy topic on my end at least. So we're talking about blockchain, cryptocurrency, and the fiat money trade itself. So I think before we start the whole session, it's kind of good to kind of start it off with a little bit of definition towards what is cryptocurrency, what is blockchain, and what uh, is consisting in that whole ecosystem. Because people talk about centralization, people talk about decentralization. But the question here is, are we finally at a point where we understand and trust cryptocurrency. So perhaps we can start uh, with that one. Lawrence, can you take us through uh, 
on your thoughts on sure. what you think at the moment? Yeah, I, I love that question, by the way, um, <laughs> because so much has happened already. I remember a couple of years back when we were working with the OECD on helping regulators and central bankers get their hands on, on this topic. And back then, like the biggest issue really was like, what, does, what is a token? What is a, a cryptocurrency? I mean, this was the whole, the whole topic back then. And if you look at today, how it's evolved, I mean, you have tokens like Bitcoin and Ethereum, they have, they're being treated as commodities. Then um, you have stable coins uh, or crypto dollars as some call them, like dollar packed um, currencies that are digitally fungible. Uh, you have non-fungible, I mean, the, the list is still endless. What I'm trying to get to is um, what the media calls cryptocurrency is a lot of different things. And I mean, the, the three main buckets are protocol tokens, I mean, digital infrastructure that has a certain use. Then you have retail um, things like stable coins that are actually fungible in an everyday uh, world. And then you have all the other thing that is exciting, experimental, and fairly new. So in terms of this discussion, I think it makes it would make most sense to separate like infrastructural um, tokens from uh, dollar packed tokens, and then everything else because everything else ties into it. Even Bitcoin ties into one of them. So I think this is the the, the most reasonable distinction to make: protocol and uh, fiat token. Right. That's a great way to start thing, Lawrence. And thank you for that definition as well. Jose, what's your say in this? Are we finally at the point where we understand the whole ecosystem? Uh, you know, I, I've been um, getting a lot of uh, connections and people asking me, they always like the way I clearly talk about things in a more practical way. Hmm. And um, this is one of them again. So, um, the, the problem is like this. I think um, blockchain is very nice. It's not something new. Okay? I remember that, for example, in Portugal, they introduced blockchain into the invoicing system in 2010, so quite a long time ago, but nobody talks about it. And uh, so all the invoices get a hatch, okay? and they are unique, right? And it's you know, implemented for the whole country. So, you know. The, the previous uh, predecessor of, of blockchain was a soft protocol, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's one thing, or, or one part of, of the essence. The other one is that um, in it, when, when it started, okay, um, it was more like the way, this is the way I look at it from a practical point. It was more like a product for people who are techie. You know, most of the uh, individuals, they don't understand the token. Right. It's very hard to, to handle it. And that's why you have these, uh, so I, I remember a bank, uh, which is a bank in Switzerland, you know, they, they came up with a hard wallet, right? Like a, a digital wallet that you could have in a hardware. So mm -hmm. people are, have been trying to develop a, a lot of things to store these tokens, but because in essence, you know, a lot of people would lose those tokens. And once you lose the, the, uh, the main token, you know, there's no way you can get it back. So you lose your money. And on the other hand, we have also seen that there are a lot of problems, which also happens with traditional money, that uh, you know uh, the, the criminal world has been stepping in either to uh, uh, make some hostages and take those tokens or whatever it is, right? So the way I, I see it is more practical and practical essence is like this. <clears throat> I think it has a purpose. I think we're going into a very good direction. I definitely don't think this is the last uh, point. I think this is a starting point, definitely. And uh, I, I strongly believe in digital currencies, in, in which format they are, if either if they represent fiat money or anything else. And uh, I strongly believe that governments more or less will step into this and regulation will step into this as well. It's just a question of time. So far, the crypto world, uh, percentage-wise, on the whole economy, uh, global economy, which is more or less like eighty-seven trillion dollars a year, uh, you know, it's still a very tiny uh, piece of the pie. So they have not right. been bothering uh, uh, themselves a lot with it, but it will happen. You know, if, if it takes a majority position, definitely with one decree, you know, just one decree, you make it illegal, you know, and you know that they step in, and. Um, 
Um, I strongly believe that the next uh, digital currency will come. We will see if we will be permitted to launch private digital currencies, because so far what we have seen, you know, uh, yes, there is a lot of private keys, etc. But mm -hmm. in essence, you know, governments will step in and we will see if they will accept and who organizations will be able to issue, right? Those, those digital currencies. That's, a, that's another story. Because now you have like thousands of these uh, uh, crypto coins, you know, and uh, in essence, the liquidity, uh, you know, I would say maximum the top five, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, Ethereum and Bitcoin is uh, part of the game. Now, still, I think the idea of um, Bitcoin, in essence, was to democratize and decentralize okay, the, the, whole, uh, the whole setup. But that's not what we are seeing. Everybody right. knows that a lot of whales control today yeah. Bitcoin, <laughs> right? Yes. And we can discuss if it's done artificially or, is, if, or, or not, right? But what mm. you see is those speculative fluctuations now. I've been studying uh, the reason for money because it has to do with my with, with the project that I'm in, in, involved in today, which is biz money. So we intend to have a uh, digital currency inside, uh, not a token. Okay, it's something new. Mm. Um, and uh, we have been looking at the reason for money. And the reason for money is basically like this. In essence, is two objectives. One is that we need an escrow. Okay, right. to get to buy something or to exchange different things, right? Mm. And that escrow basically gives you a valuation to something, or like call it an asset A, right? That's that eventually you're going to sell to to somebody uh, on the other side, which accepts that that asset you know is valued for that number. It doesn't matter what it is. You can call it dollars, euros, Bitcoin. Doesn't matter. Okay? It's just mm. an, an escrow temporarily exchange, right? And the other thing is, because this happens and you, you, this escrow, you don't execute immediately, it can take some time before the money gets out again, right? If you, if you, right. If you tell something. So means that you want to store money for the future. Now, the, or the traditional citizen, what it wants, in essence, is store money for the future. That they can take that money, whatever type of um, environment it is, and they can buy something they use for the future. And that's what they want. So the speculation around it, right, is uh, you can look at it as positive and negative. Ne positive for those who make the money, very mm -hmm. negative for those who lose a lot of money. Because at the end, I, if yeah. it's a company or if it's Bitcoin, there is one volume, right? And it's leveraging from one hand or from one person to the other person. And this is, you know, the principle of economy. Somebody is more smart than the other one. So what ordinary citizens want is that it's stable. They love to be gaining speculation, but they don't like to use to lose it, right? And there is no way you can go both hand in hand. So in essence, you know, at the end, uh, a few will gain a lot and a lot of people will lose a lot. And um, everybody talks about only the positive side of Bitcoin, but I can tell you one thing. There is also a negative side on it. And the negative side is, you know, a, a huge amount of people that have really lost a lot of money because they don't understand how it works and they don't know how to trade. So, and um, I always develop things for the masses. Okay, my concern is always um, delivering something that is good for society and less for the niche. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the way I look at it. So to round it up, definitely uh, digital currency, Okay, something new will come up. I cannot tell you what it is because, you know, maybe I don't know. And uh, definitely a blockchain and can even be a new version of blockchain. Right, right. Thank you for that. That was a good opener there. Gary, over to you. What do you think? Uh, the speculation and, and volatility of the crypto market itself. I mean, we've seen gold prices go up and down. We have seen uh, stock prices go up and down. And do you think humans in general like this volatility? <laughs> and are we all ready to understand and trust cryptocurrency? If you're a day trader, <laughs> <laughs> I think they love it. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, the swings are where people make money. The 
you know, the challenge, so there are a lot of different challenges. I just sent over an article I wrote on quantum computing, and I actually have another one coming out uh, in mm -hmm. four, probably this week on cybersecurity and quantum computing. But the challenge that we have, so let's look at where we are today. First of all, you have fiat currencies. Um, the US dollar is, you know, one of the top uh, currencies, if not the number one uh, currency today. And yet it's, you know, what's it really based on? It's based on the strength of the belief that it's, uh, you know, not not gold as a uh, as a reserve, right? Uh -huh. Richard Nixon had taken that that part away, but the strength in um, in the U.S. The challenge that you have, and I wrote another article in Forbes called "Nikola Tesla's Dream Comes True: The Doc Democratization of Opportunity." The challenge that you have, it's great that we're spreading this out. It's great that it gives people another way to be able to trade. It makes things a lot easier for sure. I mean, you can send money virtually anywhere at any time. But then there's challenges that come along with it too. So if I'm sending the money and I'm not using a bank and I don't need to have another third party involved, I'm, it's incumbent upon me to take all the risk, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have Visa or MasterCard. If somebody tries to screw me out of money, I don't have any recourse, right? I may not even know where that person is. So there's some issues that come along on top of it. The other thing is hacking. So right. my concern is about, you know, being hacked. I mean, in, in, in the cryptocurrency side, your digital wallet. I mean, I actually had had my identity stolen. So I had people go in and use my driver's license, social security number, all kinds of different things, and stole my identity, tried opening up things. I can't even imagine if they would have gotten into my digital wallet, right, if uh, mm. by some chance. The other thing is I just had a friend of mine that said he had uh, – I bought a thousand bitcoins early, early on, and those bitcoins. Uh, maybe that was you, Jose. Actually, did you? Were you the one that had them on your computer? Yes, so I, had, a, I had them on their computer, and uh, and their computer was uh, damaged, and they could never retrieve their uh, coins. A thousand. Ouch! Uh, ouch! That's a big so ouch. Bought them at, at cents, not on dollars, right? And yeah. They so. Those kind of things, you know, and what happens if somebody dies, right? And they don't, uh, right. I mean, simple kind of things. I mean, yeah. they die and you can't get in their digital wall because you can't get into the computer. So there's a whole host of things. It's interesting. There's going to be some migration towards it for hmm. sure. Uh, but then again, you've got the politics that are going to try to hold it back. Um, I was involved in a very, very, very large token sale that went south. And I actually, one of the rare deals that I've lost money on. So mm. there are situations that, you know, not everybody's willing to accept it right now. And then you got the criminal aspect of it too. I mean, you can, it's easy to shift money. So anybody can shift it, right? Mm. The next thing is we want to talk about, so that's adoption and, and hack, ha the hackability of it. The other thing is, as I've written about um, quantum computing. So can you imagine a system today that in 200 seconds can do what it take 10,000 years on a conventional computer to do. So the invincibility of the blockchain, it's gone. There, it's it will be obsolete the day that that happens. You know, it's mm -hmm. happening now, uh, Google, Microsoft, IBM, uh, but it's, and it's getting better and better all the time. So now with qubits, we can do things that are uh, unheard of. So, the, everything's at risk, right? Once the hackers get those types of technologies, or, you know, I think that what's going to happen is you're going to be able to buy time. Like the old days, you could buy time on a, a mainframe. You can buy time on a quantum computer. Oh, so okay. there's issues that are going to come up. I mean, I can imagine there's a time where there are two quantum computers in the world facing off against each other all the time, right? Attack, defend, attack, defend, you know? So, there's some challenges and we better foresee everything and look at it in a holistic view of where technology really gone. I mean, quantum computers, they're gonna fundamentally change every single part of our lives, right? Mm. We're gonna live, as you know, I mean, the goal, I did a project at Stanford University uh, with some Stanford University professors and my MBA students from a business, the top business school in Russia. And I went out for a whole summer and for eight weeks, I worked on a project was, it was called Living to 120. 
I mean, realistically, eleven to one twenty. We're not that far away. Even one fifty now. So, but these technologies are going to uh, assist us. And yeah, it, you know, it's funny, Terrence. I was reading uh, yesterday. For now. Uh, you can actually take, this is just a little off, but it's incredible how technology has changed uh, using artificial intelligence. They're now able to clone your dog for $50,000. You can have your exact <laughs> dog cloned. So if you love your dog, right? Mm. Don't clone your dog and you can have your dog again. Right. Okay. <laughs> that's, so, that's, a, that's a huge one on its own as well. And, you know, and then you add artificial intelligence on top of it, right? Mm. You start putting AI in the mix, unsupervised AI. I mean, the system that we, one of the systems that we've developed taught itself uh, foreign languages. Mm. It taught itself Spanish and uh, the first time in one hour. Then it went down through 187 different languages. It set it up. One was a, one part of the AI was a, a student, and one part was a teacher. And it went through Chinese, all kinds of Chinese dialects, 187 different languages. And so those kind of come and, you know, my friend's house, my friend's a billionaire from Russia who lives in Silicon Valley, David Yang, and his house actually talks. It, I mean, it writes me notes. It has AI, it's a soul of his house. These kind of things are gonna become commonplace. Now imagine taking quantum computing, AI, now forget the blockchain because it's gonna be obsolete. How different is the world gonna be, right? In a few years entirely different so let's look at the future and take a very holistic view of it and yes we're going to go through some steps a hundred percent because if i'm in a developing country like africa and i want to do some transaction transactions crypto becomes highly important for me and interesting right but in places like uh you know singapore the u.s europe um china I'm not sure that's going to entirely change. I don't think in the U.S. it's going to change uh, wholly anytime in the near term. So mm. I and I got concerns about the security. That stuff with, uh, you know, the hackers are going to be using incredible technologies like quantum to be able to get into your wallets. I'm not sure I want to, I won't have, <laughs> I will keep my, you know, I, I remember one time, I or actually two times, I had a dinner and I had a lunch with the co-founder of the internet. And I asked him, we were just joking around. I said, well, how do you keep the internet secure? His name's Vinton Cerf. He's a chief evangelist at Google. And I, he literally developed DARPANET, which is the internet. And he said, you got to keep it unplugged. Just keep it off. <laughs> I, I like having cash. You know what I mean? I'd rather have a, if I got a stack of bills or stack gold, at least I know it exists, right? <laughs> Right, if I right. Touch it, I like to smell it. <laughs> Correct. I mean, I mean, you're right. Then going back to that point as well. I mean, having cash is great, but is this then? I mean, just looking at the topic itself, is this then a diversification? You think of investment or on how you manage your life, or or is this going to be mainstream in a few years coming? I mean, Lawrence, what's your thought on this one? I mean, it always depends on the point of view you have. I mean, if you look at where we are today, um, like taking uh, off all macroeconomic conditions that, ha that exist today, what is it that we can invest in? What is it mm. that we can hold? We can hold cash, we can invest in equities, we can invest in something like Bitcoin, we can do more alternative investments, uh, PE, venture capital, um, I mean, I would even uh, say Bitcoin is still part of venture capital, uh, very much so, by the way. But I mean, at the end of the day, it really depends on what you want to have out of it. I mean, for a certain purpose, the co-inventor of the ARPANET would invest, would hold cash because it fits his beliefs. Um, a person in developing country has different needs and beliefs. And uh, in Western, um, in our Western world, we have other beliefs. So. What I would answer uh, to this question is, since I'm biased when it comes to blockchain, um, there's so much happening today with respect to AI, quantum computing and blockchain. I would rather argue, and this is what I'm convicted of, that 
there's no one winner takes it all and one development takes it all, but it's a rather a convergence. I mean, when it comes to blockchain, there's a very strong security aspect to it that lacks in terms of automation that you could find in AI. Um, mm -hmm. So I, what I see from the deals and developments we've seen and we're looking at that they are integrating more and more with each other. So you'll see blockchain transactions secured by quantum computing, for example, that are enabling secure and reliable AI algorithms. Mm. So this, mm. is, this is rather the perspective that I'm seeing when it comes to that part of, um, of, of, of technology. When it comes to what role does, does an asset have, like really, as I said, it depends on who are you and what's your perspective and your need today. And therefore you have a, a myriad of choices that you can pick from. It can be either either one of them or a mixture of it. Fair point. Thanks for that, Lawrence. Jose, over to you with this one. Is is it diversification? Is it improving the traditional banking system, or is it just a stamp of conviction? Uh, I mean, whoever is actually looking into blockchain or whoever is looking into cryptocurrency, what's your thoughts on this one, Jose? Um. I think you, you need to, first of all, understand human nature, you know, because it doesn't matter uh, what, what we want. I always uh, tell my team, look, it doesn't matter what you think or what you want. It matters what your public wants, what they want. So if you understand what they want, then you're on the right track, mm. right? And it's always about, in my case, right? It's always about what I say. It's, you know, we, we produce things for the standard deviation. There is no way you can produce anything for 100% of the population because we are a universe by itself. Every individual is a universe by itself, different way of thinking, you know? So you can have, um, let's say lines, which are common to the most, right? And that's what you need to figure out, those lines. Now, what I can tell you is that human nature is they want it simple, stupid, okay? And the simpler, the better, and the more stupid, you know, they, they don't want to, you know, memorize a lot of stuff and they want mm. easy easily. The reason why um, paper and coin money and the, the credit card afterward became so popular mm. is because it's just e easy handling. They don't need to think about it, right? I cannot imagine that I need to think about, and this is the problem, and not that I have nothing against it. I understand the whole principle. We, you know, we studied it in, in depth many years ago when it started. Mm. But I cannot think about anybody who's going to memorize this token chain because also you can have more than one token chain, okay? So... And even the, the, the transactions itself, you know, uh, even if you do it peer to peer, I have a lot of people that approach me and they say, well, I, I want to buy Bitcoin or I want to sell Bitcoin or this or that. But the problem is always they don't trust the system. They don't trust the other party. Nobody wants to move those coins first. Right. You know, they always want to. <laughs> and it's <laughs> always a struggle, you know. So yeah. eventually, you know, it, it, it's not that easy, you know, as it, as it sounds like. Yes, right. if you look at an exchange like La Token, yes, it's easy because you guys own the tokens, right? Yeah. And you can move it from one account to the other, okay? Right. And that's, that's instant. No problem. The token doesn't move. Okay? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different thing if, if the token moves, right? So um, um, even let me put it like this. I was reading a few articles some weeks ago, and I think this is where it more or less it will go to. So we, we now look the... Um, the machine learning chips, we, we, today we have machine learning chips, mm. okay? And it's booming, right? And I even believe that we will come up to a point because that's where it certainly will, will go to, uh, that we may have like um, quantum chips, right? right. Because we, we, we still don't know exactly, we know how to build the quantum computer. I'm strongly convinced that military services have a quantum computer for a long time already. Okay. Mm. Because I've been reading this now since 2000, let me think, 2002, 2001, right? And there was already a lot of data available on, on this subject. I strongly believe it's in place. And getting it to commercial purpose, that's, that's a different story. But once we get it into uh, some kind of an environment that it's easy to handle and to replicate, mm. Okay, mm. that's a different story. If you get it into a chip, then suddenly you could even put it in any smartphone as an example. I imagine the power that you would have with a, 
you know, a quantum smartphone, right? Right. Uh, if I look at blockchain, uh, you need, I think you need to look at blockchain like two things. One is that the, the, the token itself, and that can be obviously, it can be cracked, et cetera, et cetera. But if you link it in a way, right, and that it's a permanent record, then mm. nobody can touch it. And the way I look at blockchain is like a physical uh, notary, mm. right? So in the past, you would have the notary, you would write it down on a piece of paper, it would go into the system. Today, all notaries, at least in you know, some countries, they're all connected already. So they still use the paper for the record, but they put it in digital wise and everybody can access it. So, so the way I look at, at blockchain essentially is, yes, we can record. I don't say it's the blockchain that we have today. Okay? It would mm. be another type of, of blockchain, definitely. But definitely something which is, you know, the, the name blockchain says it by itself. It's connected to the previous record or the previous records. Right? Right. So that you cannot change it afterwards. Mm. So the, the practical side, going back to the, init the, the initial part of my speech, the practical side is, do citizens want this? That's the case. Yeah. It doesn't matter what we want, right? I've been talking this whole time, right? Just to come up to this finish. And they will decide what they want. Mm. And so far, what I see is <clears throat> that the applicability is there. Mm. The handling is not easy. Some mm. countries, they have no option. I can understand that. And they will, they will embrace it. Mm. <clears throat> but for the majority of the countries, we don't have any problem in shifting money from A to B. You know, true, true. right? So yeah. and you can do it in different ways. I don't say it's cheap. That's another problem. It should it mm. should be it should be even zero, right? You should mm. be able. To do now, what I can tell you is that inside this money, we will come up with something very exciting okay, in in the next year, somewhere at the end of the next year, and I can tell you that just in advance on it, you will be able to shift money from any country in the world in an instant. There okay? we go. Yeah, without cost. Ah, right. that's that's the kicker. Even better. <laughs> and, right. And I'll leave it can't like wait, can't wait, can't <laughs> wait for that one, Jose. Yeah. All right. Uh, can, to kind of ride on a little bit on your point as well. Do the people want it, or do the whole fiat ecosystem want it? The PayPal, the banks, have they learned from? historical performances of cryptocurrency, the good, the bad, the ecosystem. What do you think, Gary? I mean, the thing is, um, you know, <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the situation is, you know, uh, Jose's right on target with it. I mean, the situation today, the only time that I use crypto, if it's difficult, uh, if I'm trying to transfer money, somebody's got to pay me, for instance. And um, it's very difficult because they're in a, a developing country. They're in Africa or, you know, someplace like that where it's really hard for them. That is the way they transfer the money around, right? So then I do it. But, you know, Jose is right on target with saying that, you know, why would, from my standpoint, I use PayPal a lot. I use my banks a lot. And I just like having them, as I said, and Visa and MasterCard, American Express, having the responsibility, right? If somebody doesn't, if I'm sending something, here's where it gets interesting. If I'm sending something out, money, and I get a product or service, a car, right? And it's not what was agreed, what recourse do I have with a third party today, right? I don't know. And maybe I haven't done that with crypto, but I don't, I wouldn't do it because if it's uncommon upon me, there's a great chance. I remember one, one time I ordered something off eBay. Actually, um, my wife is a doctor and um, my ex-wife is a doctor and we ordered medical books on eBay and I got a cookbook that weighed the same amount as a medical book. It was an old <laughs> dusty old cookbook. And, <laughs> I took a picture of it. I sent to eBay and I got my money back. But I mean, and it was only, it was a couple hundred dollar book, right? It was a physical book, but they wanted you to have that book. So what recourse would I have? And those are the kind of things that um, I would have concern. I use it a lot, 
uh, you know, in terms of when something's not what they say. I've got a bike recently, a $3,000 bike, and the bike was supposed to have this type of a Yamaha assisted motor on it. Mm. And instead of having the best one, it had the worst one. And in the literature, it said the best one. Well, I have recourse, right? Because I got Citibank and I have recourse. What recourse would I have? And that, I mean, that's like an insurance policy for me. And it takes some of the sting out of dealing online, right? What if somebody happens to steal your credit card? They do a skimmer on, um, you know, in a, a gas station and they steal your information. Well, if I had a digital wallet and they cracked it, I'd be pretty pissed off because they have access to everything. At least I got a buffer from between me and the bad guys. So those are the kind of thing. And I think in terms of, uh, you know, where we are adoption, it's going to be once we solve some of these other kind of issues, what I think quite frankly is going to happen is you're going to have a lot of fiat currency transactions. And then on the fringes where it's really difficult to use for currency in those kind of states or those kind of places, that's where you're going to see mass adoption. And once they work out the kinks, it could come forward. But again, quantum computers sitting around the corner, right? Mm -hmm. You're right. I think that's a good way to kind of put that as well. And and just uh, again, for those of you who are viewing in uh, from wherever you are around, uh, again, this is La Token and this is VCTV. So VCTV in essence is a place where we get VCs to sit on a panel and talk about a particular topic or discuss a few things that are going on around the environment itself. Now you can get in. You can join us. You can pose your questions. Again, it's all in the links below. So do like, subscribe, and do all the necessary and get in touch with all of us. Uh, just to kind of continue on with uh, where we left, uh, let's talk a little bit on the investments itself. Now, the investments that you're making, the investments that you're seeing, because the people now watching you they are business owners, they are startups, they are those interested in the topics itself. So Lawrence, perhaps you can take us through this one. Talk to us about what you see happening and why the VCs are actually paying attention to the subject, the business and the startups in the ecosystem. Yeah, so I mean, also to split this into two worlds, uh, from an investment into token, uh, which we did with our first fund. Obviously, by investing in such, you're supporting those teams as well, like de continuously developing that code to find its use case and adoption, which is very critical. Um, on the other side, which is probably a bit more tangible, investing into startups that are, that are building software that may have or may not have a blockchain component, hmm. it still begs the question, is this a business model that's better, superior um, by using blockchain as a technology compared to not using it. So that must be a clear yes in terms of an answer. But why it is interesting is um, from our perspective, because blockchain offers sort of an upgrade to existing B2B infrastructures. So this is uh, quite important to understand because our conversations with corporates continuously reveal that they are looking into their own software setups and they find gaps when it comes to monetizing data. They find inefficiencies through and through. So they're actively looking at improving their status quo to continuously be competitive in the future. And in light of that, we see a lot of demand for blockchain enabled software um, because it just helps automate a lot of processes that exist today, but are uh, b burdensome that are inefficient and so there's in other words there's a strong corporate demand for better software solutions and we see a lot of those being developed and already in play um, from from our investment scope nice thank you for that lawrence jose over to you when it comes to the vc's point of view i mean as someone wearing that vc hat that you rightly have on uh, why should businesses kind of pay attention to the topic and why are you paying attention uh, with regards to the ecosystem? So uh, one of the, the problems uh, that we face and being practical is uh, 
is more or less like this. Um, 99% of, of the businesses that kick off today in the world, they are not about innovation. So it's just 1%. So typically uh, VCs, right, they mm-hmm. tend to look at it at 1%. But we cannot forget that from that 1%, only 3% will ever be selected. Yeah. And it has to do, and I, I, I would like to explain this because I think the, 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 the viewers that watch this, mm-hmm. they need to understand how the ecosystem works. Right. So a, a lot of them, they are not well prepared. They, the only thing they see is uh, getting those funds, but look at VCs not only getting those funds, look at them also as a add-on that can bring um, a lot of um, value to you, also strategic wise, right? Especially if you have a lead, in, uh, a lead investor, you know, he can bring on board uh, other investors as well, mm. okay? And in a lot of cases, they also have a lot of know-how. You know, it's not that they don't have know-how, so they know exactly what they want. So you, uh, if you are looking on, on the outlook for funds, first of all, you need to understand uh, does this uh, private investor or this venture capitalist or the private equity, um, do you fit in their criteria? It's not if they fit in yours, it's if you fit in theirs because they have the money and they will decide in whatever they want to invest in, okay? So before you start losing your time and making losing their time, first check out if this investor, you know, essentially fits, right? Or that you fit. In, in their investment criteria, if yes, then go ahead, study them, and you know, uh, come up with an approach and explain them, uh, you know, where what they really are looking for, right? And then probably you're very close to to achieving getting into the pipeline to achieve the funds. If you don't do it like this, you know, you there are cases, you know, that you get like a thousand or two thousand notes. It's not uncommon, right? Mm-hmm. And most people uh, are not able to hold on that long. You know, uh, some teams do, but a lot of teams don't. So they fall off. So in my case, I'm very clear. Look, I'm looking for um, solutions, technology that can enhance, um, you know, the uh, this money setup, which uh, especially on the focus of business inclusion, it touches a lot of areas, okay, like um, uh, social networking, marketplaces, banking. Uh, business process automation, messenger, okay, so all those areas. But in the background, we have artificial intelligence, machine learning, parts and blockchain, okay, digital currency. Mm-hmm. So if you have something that can make it happen that we can have a best, better business inclusion for everybody on this planet, I'm all ears. And typically, I look at the stage, mm-hmm. which is pre-seed, because essentially I'm looking for talent. Okay. Okay. I give much more value to talented teams than I give uh, to the project itself. Mm. And for pre-seed or eventually seed stage, you know, and I don't go further than seed stage. It's not in my interest to go uh, into early stage or later stage. And the reason for that is because you have a lot of other alternatives on the market okay, that uh, come in that area. Mm. So it's not the right fit for me. Right. So please, please get in touch and uh, here. Tick on that button at last open, you know, if you think you are in this, uh, in this investment criteria and you love what we are doing, then, you know, we are very happy to talk to you. Excellent. Thank you for that, Jose. That's a brilliant one as well. Uh, Gary, again, uh, just coming to you, but again, not diluting the whole thing. You mentioned earlier about regulations catching up as well. Perhaps this is a question for you, Gary. Uh, how do you actually create regulations uh, for something that wants to be a decentralized platform in a way? I mean, we look look at things like that, or will it end up regulated eventually, you think? What's your thoughts on this? I mean, in order, I mean, it's already, I mean, when you start getting the large banks involved, they'll have to start. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the idea behind the one investment that we made, I mean, Mm -hmm. they had problems with the regulators, right? So it's going to happen. You just got to get society to really the politicians, society, the big um, banks, the institutions to be able to buy off on it. So it's going to happen. It's going to take, um, it'll take uh, some time. So this is a journey, right? We're in a, here we are. I mean, in in the U S right now, we have record COVID levels, right? 
Um, right. And we're in an entirely different society. So we, you know, one thing about uh, being able to go into a bank, you can't even go into a bank here right now. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Right, you have to do transactions through a drive-through. That we fundamentally shifted all banking, and you know, if the vac if a vaccine comes out, it's great. If not, we got another three years of this stuff to ride mm. through. So our mm. society is going through a massive digital transformation right now. So all of us here we are in Zoom, as mm. I've said many times. I remember almost uh, well five and a half years ago when I was one of the first users of Zoom, and uh, Eric's uh, the founder of Zooms. Uh, one of his VCs hooked me up with it. My friend said, oh, don't use it. It's not any good. You know, it, <laughs> use Skype. Why would you use something that's unproven? I'm not going to yeah. I'm not gonna click in that link you sent to me. Why would I want to do it? I said, because this stuff's really, really good. My partner and I started, uh, my partner's got a PhD in AI for my hey. Evo. And we started to use it. Now, here we are. And I just checked, I actually wrote him a few weeks ago. And um, uh, Eric, and he, I checked, I, I can't even believe, he's worth $19 billion today. Nin there we go. He, he right? placed that bet right. <laughs> he placed it right. I mean, the thing yeah. is, but, the, but, you know, part of it is we're going through this digital transformation. So the point is, if you were to say uh, over a year ago, where would we be today a year ago? Things are a lot different. We're willing to accept changes because we have no other way of doing business, right? Mm. And you can't travel. So uh, even in Russia, when you you buy a, a flat, you use cash, right? Mm. And literally cash. You have suitcase of cash and you take it in. I'm sure it's like that in other parts of the world too. So we've got to fundamentally shift. It's changed. I mean, people can't get out of their houses now. I just talked to somebody on uh, Latokan a few weeks ago, and he said he hadn't been out of his house since March, literally out of his house. So things have changed. So we're more willing to accept the technology. The point is, I think that we're going to look at things like cryptocurrency a lot closer than we ever did before, because we now have to figure out how to be able to keep business moving forward. I'm hopeful and optimistic that we've moved in that direction. And again, you know, quantum computers are going to put, you know, quantum computers are the wild card here. And it's going to yeah. happen. It is happening. I remember, you know, uh, 19, a long time ago, 1991, 92, I was on the web, right? I was on the, um, on the uh, internet. And I asked my engineer to, I couldn't figure out where all the websites are. So he made me a printout. I only had a thousand websites and he printed <laughs> them out on paper, seriously. Right. And, and I was fascinated by it. And here we are fast forward later I mean, it's everything's changed. So I'm hopeful. I mean, back then people didn't realize how powerful it was going to be. Right. They didn't realize Vint and Surf, I asked him directly, you know, the co-father of the internet. And he said, I didn't realize it was going to be as powerful as it is today. You know, so I mean, I think that's where we are with a lot of these emerging technologies and with cryptocurrency, obviously this changes people's lives. If you're in a place like Africa and you have no other, I remember it was on one of the panels and there were a couple of, actually I was on a, a panel in Africa. We were doing, I was judging startups and that's how they do the business. You know what I mean? It's like, you got to transfer money around. It's, you do it, you know, peer to peer. It's very simple. So it's right. interesting. Chall right. interesting challenging times but the good thing the resourcefulness of humanity we adapt to the changes i'm interested by the way in ai companies why because artificial intelligence from my standpoint is like a tidal wave coming in it is a new electricity this is the beginning of the 20th century and think about the changes once nikola tesla you know fair day uh, obviously was involved as a founder but nikola tesla made the dream come true Think about over the next 30 years, how in agriculture, manufacturing, the quality of lives, you know, how everything, uh, healthcare, how everything changed because of uh, electricity and where we are today. Well, that boom is coming again and AI is that new electricity. Got it. Thanks for that one. You're right. I mean, some of the things that you mentioned there, those are definitely brewing industries. Telly, welcome to the panel, Telly. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, 
<laughs> no worries. <laughs> Delhi, we're talking about blockchain, cryptocurrency, and the whole fiat money trade. So, so yeah. within that ecosystem, Telly, perhaps I want to ask you this question in terms of uh, kind of getting your preference in a way. Cash, Bitcoin, or stablecoin? What do you prefer and why? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough question. I guess it really <laughs> depends on what part of the world you're in. Um, yeah. My preference is not cash, obviously. My preference would be possibly stablecoin. And the reason why stablecoin is uh, because stablecoin retains a particular value. Uh, for me, Bitcoin has really become a, a store of value. So it's, it's almost like gold. It's to me, it's an investment product, not necessarily one that allows me to transfer value transfer just like that. Mm. Um, cash is still king in many parts of the world because of the, the whole issue. It's easy, you know, for adoption. But I could tell you, I, you know, normally I just use my card for everything. Um, where I see the friction, I live in the Caribbean, as you know, so the friction for me is really in cross border. Um, even as simple as e-commerce, um, unfortunately, we haven't really developed our payment rails or payment gateways as such. So what, what you would call as, as saturated in North America, in Europe, and most of the developed world, in the mm. developing world, is still quite nascent and, and growing. So that's where I see huge opportunity in developing countries. In, in the area of payment gateways that connect with you know, different systems. And then when you're looking at um, the opportunities and why I say stable coins as well, stable coins afford you that uh, ability to, I guess, facilitate this whole cross-border region, at least for now. We are, we are heading into a direction or a destination that I believe will be eventually maybe totally decentralized, right? But in the, in, the, in the meantime, we still have to live between this centralized finance world and, and decentralized finance world. And so you need a bridge. And I see stable coins as facilitating that bridge. Right. For example, in, in, when you're looking at, let's take Africa you know, as a context, um, country like Nigeria, Nigeria has a a stable coin now, at least one stable coin that's, that's operational. And what I found is really interesting is they have improved their national payment infrastructure to the point where just like America, you can facilitate interbank transfers like in seconds. Yeah, mm. this, is, this is an amazing achievement for a developing country, right? And that's something other countries could take point. But then the next step is now, now that they've created a stable coin, you know, within, within their ecosystem, they're now able to then transfer money locally. It stays locally, partner with liquidity providers and leverage Bitcoin. So you're seeing that movement of leveraging Bitcoin and stable coin in order to, to, to facilitate cross-border. So this is now the new way of, of moving money Mm. Uh, along cross border and and pretty much it's like a seamless otc otc type transaction that takes place on exchanges using that stable coin so i see stable gold coins as really the bridge uh until we get to that final destination now the ticklish thing you mentioned before where is regulation and you know and, and is, is the space going to be regulated? You're already seeing uh, central banks starting to create their own um, digital currencies, central bank issued currencies. In order to be part of that conversation, they don't want to be left out. And I think that's powerful in a way because if you have then your existing fiat existing in a digital format, it then, it then increases the speed of transactions, right? Because then you can switch from this, this digital currency into, um, into a stable coin, bum, out, in and out of Bitcoin, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that is a forward movement. And also it's a signal that the regulators also want to understand the landscape and learn in order to regulate it. I see regulation coming definitely um, from a 
from an enabling perspective, but also, but also in order to mitigate, you know, obviously the dangers that we have in this space. Right. Thank you so, for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right, Ali. Thank you for that one as well. And I think just just about kind of to sum things up. I mean, we have about 10 minutes left on the show. So let's try to sum it up for the businesses that are on board watching you at the moment. Do we have enough encouragement for them, you think, uh, ladies and gentlemen? And how should we kind of, uh, let's put it, kind of make them to adopt or encourage adoption? Perhaps, Lawrence, you can start with this one and kind of end it. Sure. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, <laughs> encouragement comes from uh, both motivational drivers, either it's vision or it's need. So mm -hmm. it really depends on what you're looking at. Do you see a market need that you're trying to fulfill? Or are you working on a vision where you might see that a, a market need may occur? Both aspects are very interesting. They require completely different sort of financing. Um, if I had to put an example on, on each of them, um, the more tangible ones, the market need ones are the ones that I described before, which are B2B solutions that uh, require or do an improvement in terms of the technological, technological infrastructure they have. And then on the more visionary note, I, I would account for anything around uh, decentralized finance protocols that allow uh, automated lending and yield uh, things to take place for each and every one of us on a retail level. But this is from a techn technological point of view, still a few years ahead and quite experimental at this stage, even though it works, it's still very crypto native and therefore quite visionary, I would say. So this is how, how I would describe the future, that there is an existence uh, and a need for both. And as I said, it requires a different trade and a different approach in terms of venture capital financing. And um, uh, we're, in, we're in it for both uh, because we believe in both of these futures. And um, I encourage everyone to think about it. And what we've seen so far is that quite some of the brightest minds um, I've come across are dealing with those two aspects. And that's also one thing that I enjoy very much to be working with these founders uh, to answer the question, what's pragmatic now, what's visionary for the future and to be part of both. And um, I I'm sorry, I have to jump off at this stage as well. I have something I cannot miss, unfortunately. No but, worries. Uh, we had the tail as, as a the final show. sermon from my side. That that's yeah. what I wanted to to, uh, to get across and tell you, gentlemen. It's, it's been my pleasure, and uh, looking forward to speaking soon. No worries. Thank you for that point, Lauren, and uh, join us again on the next show. Uh, Thank you, Jose. Off to you. Uh, just uh, your final words on the topic itself. Are we encouraging the businesses enough, or the people enough, or? Are we looking at other ways of adoption here? I mean, what do you think? Um, on that point, um, I would like to say two things. Uh, one is that um, Lawrence uh, said quite some interesting things. And what, what I can say is that what Lawrence is saying is not future telling. Hmm. Okay? What Lawrence was saying is exactly uh, what we already have at this moment. So it's not hmm. something coming in the next five, 10 years, it's already here. Right. And uh, we strongly believe that uh, this adoption um, will be massive. And the reason because we believe this is because it's, a, it's an untapped area. Okay, remember that I always saying that the, this issue of business inclusion, business inclusion cannot be underestimated, you know, because on, every, on this planet, every two people, and every 10, right, is touched by business inclusion. You know, we are talking about 20% of global population, which is affected by this, this topic. And 99% of everybody who, who, who tries to kick off every year, right, basically uh, doesn't fit uh, into this business inclusion. What I mean is that they need to have a solution which has never come up in hundreds uh, of years. Right? So, this is a, a real big thing. And the only way you can make it happen is more or less uh, with a description you can even uh, broaden it out uh, that Lawrence uh, made. 
So um, we feel that the topic besides uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and you know, and uh, all the other things, including quantum computing. But humanitarian topic, I'm not talking about the technology, I'm talking about the humanitarian uh, topic that mm. will affect people drastically mm. is the topic business inclusion, okay? Mm. Uh, mm. It's not only about energy and food, you know, it's also about how we make things happen. So you can produce food, mm. you know, but how are you going to, to bring it efficiently mm. to the body and how is going to this be, be paid up? Our mm. systems that we have today, the way it works, the, the whole economy is a very inefficient machine with a lot of speculation on the whole right. process, right? And, right. Um, you know, or, or, although uh, I would like to say it, at the essence is we are paying a bill, you know, every, everybody's paying a bill that could be much better. We could have a much better life if this machine would become much more efficient. Right, <laughs> true. And that's <laughs> yeah. and, and we could also help those, you know, who are willing to contribute. Remember, forty-five million people give it a try every year. You know how many official incorporated companies we have in the world? Four hundred fifty million. That's right? a big number when you put it together. Correct. So we are we yeah. are talking about a renovation of ten percent a year mm. that people try to renovate the system. And of that 10% a year that try to renovate the system, only a half percent of that, that 10% will survive five years. And only uh, seven, or let's say 25% of those 10% or 2.5% will ever survive the first year. Now, this is a huge impact. Mm. Okay. So I would leave it like that. That's a very good one. Uh, I think of all the viewers out there, that's a good point to think about as well. Gary, what's your final thoughts on the subject? And do you agree with that? I mean, the situation is, um, as I said, we are going through this massive digital transformation and uh, it's unprecedented. And in fact, McKinsey said a little over a year ago, 92% of the companies were thinking about going through a digital transformation over the next 10 years. And that literally has happened in six months after the pandemic because oh. we had to do it. So I'm very hopeful that a lot of changes will take place in terms of crypto, blockchain, where we are, of course. I mean, we're exploring all areas. Everything's open at this point. There are some challenges that we've got to address, regulation challenges, uh, security challenges, et cetera. But I mean, this is the way humanity works. I've seen a lot of this uh, in technology. You know, I've been around the block uh, a number of years. I've worked in artificial intelligence stuff 30 years ago. So, I mean, I've, I've seen it from Ops 5 and Lisp. To where we are today i've seen those changes and i've been part of those changes i've done 16 companies so i'm hopeful this is a great time ai mm -hmm. is the new electricity every single thing we talk about terence today has some type of ai component for the most part because if not you're not going to be able to process the data think about it no matter what it is even with blockchain right and to be able for the encryption the capabilities, I mean, AI is going to have some type of involvement because we are inundated with information. The amount of data on the planet Earth increases at 61 to 62% every single year. How in the world are we going to be able to? So if I was a startup out there, I would look at artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, deep learning. I've written several articles about this, deep learning versus machine learning. And I mean, it was my most viewed article ever. And I didn't think that that would ever be the case. Why? Because people just don't understand it. And so we are at a, we're just at the beginning of this and it's a very, very interesting time. Startups make sure going global is critically important for you. Mm -hmm. Regional dominance is critically important to make sure your product market fit, uh, make sure that you've got the right team, but then you'd have to look in these, these trying times, how to be able to go global. Going global is the key. You've got to dominate a market if you want to get the VCs to, to invest in you. They want to have a company that's a billion dollar opportunity, right? That's just what they want. So good, bad, or indifferent, like it or not. And the, you know, the, if you look at the behind those uh, VCs, there's a lot of super high net worth individuals, pension funds, et cetera. They're the people that are doing the vesting. Excellent. Thank you for that point, Gary. Very insightful. Indeed. Telly, 
final words from yourself, Deli. Summarize Thank it for you. us, yeah. Summarize it. Well, just, uh, just to summarize <laughs> there real quick, uh, sure. based on what Jose and Gary have indicated, pretty much I can sum it into um, understanding that we need a new type of infrastructure layer that allows us to propel, allow us to innovate our business models that implement uh, digital financial transformation. As Gary would have pointed out, it's not just about blockchain. It's a number of things. You need to have AI, blockchain, data, reg tech. You need to understand even when you're going cross border to dominate, you have to understand the different laws in the different jurisdictions. You need to understand corporate structuring and a whole bunch of stuff. So it's a lot of learning. It's not relegated to one specific topic. So you have to be multi-sector and multi, multi-disciplinary in your approach. So this actually speaks to your team. Your team should be diverse, extremely multi-sectoral, multi, multi, multilingual as well also helps when you're, when you're launching things. I'm fluent in Spanish and a number of other languages. It's important. It's important to source out all these things in order to complement and then understand that as you start implementing your business models and you're looking at business model innovation, you should also look at trying to, to incorporate some embedded aspects in, in, in terms of your whole approach. So embedded finance is big, that is the future. That would also unlock a lot of value. And you know, when it comes to raising, it's all about valuation. So I think um, it's, for me, that's important. And then you need to learn Find out how to train and, and understand how, how all of these get, come together and become connected. So that's my, my takeaway. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Telly. Thank you for summarizing it for us as well. And to those watching in again, this is VCTV by La Token. I would like to thank the panel and ladies and gentlemen out there. Thank you. Bye-bye. And 